Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you help us, that we will not only be hearers of your word, but that we will be doers as well in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past few weeks in our series, What We Believe and Why, we have been learning together the theological meanings of the words and phrases of the Apostles' Creed. We learn that the meaning of God, we learn the meaning of God, the Father Almighty, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. We also learn the meaning of the Holy Christian Church. This morning, we will be concluding our series with a reflection on the last four phrases of the Apostles' Creed as written in Luther's small catechism. The last four phrases of the Apostles' Creed are, one, the communion of sin, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What is the communion of sins? The word communion does not just mean affiliation or association with like-minded people. It is actually deeper than that. Communion refers to the bound of fellowship and interrelationship that have been formed by the Holy Spirit among the people of God in all ages and places. The word saint is a common term used in the scripture. It indicates that something is holy. In fact, the first century believers refer to each other regularly as holy ones. Paul addressed the believers in Corinth, in Rome, and Jerusalem as sins. So when we affirm that we are, when we confirm that we believe in a communion of sins, we are affirming that we believe in a whole community of the faithful followers of Christ, living and dead, past, present, and future. The writer to the Jewish Christians in Romans chapter 11 acknowledged this affirmation when he wrote to them about their perseverance in the faith despite opposition. He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sins that easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. A preacher once said, when we gather in worship, we praise God with believers we cannot see. When we celebrate Holy Communion, we feast with past, present, and future disciples of Christ. Let us keep this vibrant and important communion. The second phrase, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. What is the forgiveness of sins according to the Bible? Well, there are two kinds of forgiveness in the Bible. First, God's pardon of our sins, 1 John 1, 9, and our obligation to pardon others, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. So what do we believe about the forgiveness of sins? Luther says, God promises that for Christ's sake, he will not hold our many sins against us. God forgives us of our sins for the sake of Christ's satisfaction. 
Christ bore the punishment and curse for our sins so that we may never come into condemnation. God forgives sins because he is merciful and because of Christ's atoning sacrifice for our sins. However, biblical forgiveness requires repentance on our part, turning away from our old life by the help of the Holy Spirit. The Apostles' Creed declares forgiveness as central to the Christian faith. God offers the forgiveness of sins in the gospel. We receive the forgiveness of sins through faith, that is, by believing the promise of the gospel. Forgiveness brings about peace with God through the Lord Jesus and peace with our neighbors. When we affirm that we believe in the forgiveness of sins, we are affirming that God has forgiven us of our sins through the atoning sacrifice of Christ, and we too are obligated to forgive others. We also affirm that God continues to forgive us of our sins on a daily basis as well. The third phrase, the resurrection of the body. Luther says, on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the Bible reads, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus will raise our bodies and transform them into glorified bodies for eternal life in the new heaven. Jesus taught and demonstrated this by his own resurrection, that life does not end at death, that our bodies will be resurrected from the grave and will live with God forever. But for unbelievers, it is a different story. They too will be resurrected from the grave, but to eternal death. As for the believer, when he dies, immediately he will be in the presence of Christ in heaven. But his body will remain in the grave until the resurrection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible reads, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So when we affirm that we believe in the resurrection of the body, we are affirming that our bodies will not be left in a grave, but will be resurrected and transformed into glorified bodies. Amen. The fourth phrase is everlasting life. Luther said, when I am raised from the dead on the last day, I will enjoy being with Christ in his new creation in body and soul forever. In John chapter 6, verse 40, the Bible reads, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Everlasting life is not just something we look forward to when we die or when Christ returns. It is something we can experience now in anticipation of a further experience in the future. Everlasting life is a life that begins when we are brought into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John chapter 5, verse 24. So when we affirm that we believe in the life everlasting, we are affirming that we are going to live in the presence of God in this new heaven. 
He is new creation forever, as Luther stated. Notice the creed ends with a last word, amen. Now for many of us, amen means it's time to eat. <laughs> but the word amen actually means so be it, or it is true. The creed starts with I believe and ends with amen. So be it. So let us conclude this series on the Apostles' Creed by saying a big amen. God bless you.